everybody. Welcome to RDA Tech Q&A. You've got questions. We've got guesses. Um, I am Nash. I do Radio Dead Air, and I've had many years experience working with technology and fiddly electronical thingies. And this is Mike Gearman. As with me, as always, is my uh, producer from Radio Dead Air. He also does a lot of electronic fiddly things. Yeah. I'm I'm really coherent tonight. Thank you, everybody. I I'm <laughs> I yeah. I you'll have to forgive me. I am I am on uh, allergy pills and whatnot, and uh, I had a wonderful time. Because if you're um if the air is very dry and you are allergic to things, so your nasal cavities, all sorts of fun things already going on, and you take headache pills that are aspirin based. It's sort of like this fountain of blood that just blew. I, 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 I don't take aspirin. I take ibuprofen for my headaches. That don't work it for me. It seems to work better for me. It doesn't work. work for me. Wow. I would recommend getting a humidifier, but I feel that Grady would make it break very quickly by playing with it. Yeah, and that, that getting the humidifier, that's great, but that doesn't really help me after the blood fountain has already begun. That's not going to make it stop. No. Okay, so that's a different problem. It's a little bit, you know, horses are already out of the barn. Anyway. Um, we are answering your questions as always tonight. If you have a tech-related question, you can send that to us at requests at radiodeadair.com. We can endeavor to see if we can help you with your problems, but also we're going to be talking a little bit about the news, which is, God, the news just makes, ugh, every day is something worse. It's always something worse. But it's not just America, though. No. No, no, England's... There, there is tech stupidity in other parts of the world. Yeah, and UK has been having a wonderful time of incredibly stupid shit lately. Well, you know, when you've got people like uh, Michael Gove, and, and Boris Johnson and, and Nigel Farage uh, voting in your government. Oh, and Theresa May. She's not, she ain't. Yes, but see, her problem is that she's had to deal with, primarily is she's had to deal with Michael Gove and Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage. I get the feeling if the three of them turned up dead, she'd be much better at her job. I don't think so. I think she wouldn't mind if they turned up dead. Probably not, but no. regardless, um, one of the big things that happened this past week was the UK has released a bill. It is dubbed the, well, it's been dubbed the Snoopers Charter. Yep. Um, it's a bill that was uh, introduced into Parliament and it has, uh, it's been passed. It's a law now um, yep. that it is waiting for the, the uh, fully... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? C ceremonial. It st still has to be ceremonially signed by the Queen. Yeah. But that's that, that's just a formality, uh, at least in theory. I mean, I suppose she could not sign it and they wouldn't know what they'd be going, oh, what, oh, what, wait, what? But she's supposed to sign anything to put in front of her. Yeah. The, the law covers um, a vast expansion of uh, spying. That's the wrong shot. There we go covers a vast expansion of spying on the part of the government on stuff like the internet. And and I've been looking over some of the things that it entails. One of the most notable is um, they require internet service providers to retain records of your browsing habits yep. for up to a year. Now, the screwy part about that, which they don't get into until the later part of this article, is that it's not all ISPs. No. It's just some ISPs, which the government has, the government has specifically spoken to, but those ISPs can't tell you that they've done it. Yes. But even, even better, I'm going to explain how this is, aside from being... A, a hideous affront to just the idea of 
illegal privacy. search and seizure, privacy, yeah, you know, due process. I'm going to explain how this entire law is idiotic. And this is aside from, from all of the, the moral grounds, the ethical grounds. Here's how your ISP keeps records if they were to do this. They have uh, a list of what uh, sites you visit based on, let's say, you, you're at your computer, you type google.com, and your ISP says, oh, I see you've gone to google.com, because it can see you talk to the Google machine. Yeah. The it Google knows what machine. IP address you have and says, where has he gone? Now, if you were to use a VPN, a, is, is it virtual private or virtual proxy network? Which is oh, virtual for? private. For, yeah. If you were to use a VPN, this would completely negate the point of this law. What a VPN does is when you type in google.com, your computer talks to Google, Google talks back to your computer. A VPN serves as a middleman. Instead of talking straight to Google, you type in google.com, you talk to the VPN. That's another little network set over here. And then the VPN sees, oh, that guy wants to talk to Google. Hey, Google, and it serves as an intermediary. Yeah, now, in theory, depending on how deep packet diving they're doing on this, they could still get the information. But that requires a lot more hardware and a lot more effort on their part. And it remains to be seen how many people will go the VPN route. And a lot more money, too. See, yes. when, when you do it the VPN that way, the ISP no longer sees that you talk to Google. All they can see is that you're talking to this VPN. Back, that's it. That's all. They just see information's going back and forth to the VPN. It's not and seeing... It, as your connection should... Your VPN should be encrypted. Yeah. It's not seeing what information you asked the VPN to go look for. It just sees you're just talking to the VPN. So this entire law is completely negated by the use of a VPN, meaning any competent criminal threat or security threat to the United Nations, which is the point of this law. It's, it's a security-based law. Any competent threat to the United Kingdom that uses a VPN can completely get around this. Yeah. Um, now, they say in here they, the telecoms company can be uh, required to decrypt things. I'm like, well, they're not necessarily going to have the keys. No, they're not. And, you know, the, the, the big concern for me is not that they're, they're potentially going after terrorists. I'm fine with government going after terrorists. That, I think, is part of their job. That makes sense. It's the person who's going and going, uh, I'm checking out uh, divorce lawyers or suicide prevention stuff who are going to have their... Because here's, here's the kicker in this. It's not just, say, MI5 and MI6, which, right. if you ever watch a James Bond movie, you know who those are. Mm -hmm. um, who can look at this data. It's quite a lot of agencies, including, uh, hang on, where was it? This, this is the one that got me. Uh, fire officials, tax inspectors, and food regulators. Food regulators will be able to request your internet browsing habits. Yeah, because it, it, it's not just a, it's not just a, we have to put in, oh, they've, they've stored it, we need to put in a warrant. They can just, no, we, we have access, we can look. So if you think you're, if you're a food inspector, you think your wife is cheating on you, you can look at her browsing history. No warrant the, required, the, no need yeah, for, the, yeah. the tax inspectors, I sort of understand. I don't necessarily agree, but I sort of understand because the UK has had in the last few years, a number of very high profile tax avoidance schemes come to life come to light, mm. um, uh, including people who had been knighted doing massive, massive tax avoidance schemes. Um, 
and some people who will never be knighted because of various things mm-hmm. and their tax avoidance schemes. So it's it's it is to use a I believe I have this term in use correctly to, to use the a British term correctly. It's a dog's breakfast. Yeah. Well, it it it, it gets it, it gets even worse. ISPs are required to retain this data for up to a year. I I don't know how much the average person surfs the web. I surf a lot. Um, that seems like it's going to add up to a lot of data storage very quickly. Well, it doesn't even matter if it's a uh, matter the size of the data storage. The very fact the data storage exists. How often does shit get hacked these days? This is true. How normally without retaining that data, there is no target for hackers by an ISP retaining all of that data. That's uh, like British Telecom. That, that's pretty much a giant signal flare. Hey, we can look up people's information. We can um, have blackmail material on them. We can have all of their entire life. All we have to do is hack into this telecom, which is a whole lot less secure than hacking into the government. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm certain uh, that the British press, who also has a history of doing all sorts of shady things, mm-hmm. when you say you look at, uh, was it, it wasn't The Sun, it was um, News of the World. News of the World. News of the World had a history of shady things. From Rupert the Murdoch's company, yep. I strongly suspect anyone that Rupert Murdoch doesn't like, which is anyone on the liberal side of the spectrum or anyone who's mm. trying to prevent him from buying something he wants, uh, is going to see their ISP not necessarily get hacked, but someone there be paid off or someone in the food inspectors, uh, food regulators area be paid off to provide internet records on somebody he doesn't like. And again, he's I'll... done it before. And this is, this is not libelous, by the way. He's, his people have done this before. They hacked people's yep. uh, cell phones to get their voicemails. Yep. It's a huge scandal. In fact, they, they, they actually traced it back and potentially hacked a few people in New York with the same yeah. scam. So it's it's not out of the realm of possibility that this all of this data is just sitting there right for the plucking. Who is going to pay to protect the ISP's data. The government, th- there's nothing in the law to provide at giving money. Yeah, no, they'll, 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 they'll say, well, well, we'll encrypt it. Some, many of them will encrypt it. There'll be at least one small ISP that forgets how to do encryption or just puts it in a database, an unencrypted database and lets it sit. That'll be public facing. That'll be the first one. I guarantee it'll happen. Mm. We'll hear about it in the next six months is my bet. Um, and again, it, 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 it's ridiculous. And again, all it takes to bypass this entirely is a simple VPN, which is at best maybe $70 a year. Not even a really good VPN either. Just a simple one. Just any old VPN service out there would negate the entire power that this law would have. Now, the average person isn't going to bother with a VPN. True. Criminals are criminals who actively want to terrorist criminals. Anyone else who's actively attempting to evade the government can do so very simply. This is and people in the channel are mentioning this, too. This is the TSA all over again. This is an invasion of privacy that provides no actual security benefit. It is security theater. And it's worse than the TSA because the potential for harm going forward is even greater. Yeah. Now, the government won't be liable when there's a hack. The ISP will probably be liable. Yeah. But they'll they'll try to they'll try to say, oh, we're, we're uh, complying with government directives. Uh, you should go after them. Now, it's still being challenged. Uh, it's going to be challenged in the British court system. And because they're not out of the EU yet. It can be appealed all the way to the EU courts. Yeah. And I suspect that the courts will limit it in some fashion. In general, this was a tremendous waste of everyone's time, money, a tremendous potential privacy breach for every UK citizen. 
and j- just a complete and total waste of of every everything. It's so frustrating. This this was idiocy for all the way down. And don't even and the encryption stuff. I don't even want to try and de go through the nonsense of the, having require. There's a requirement in there that um, companies must comply with the government to assist in people get, decrypting users' information, which is essentially requiring that all devices in the UK must be unencryptable by the manufacturer, meaning there has to be some sort of security backdoor in every device. Meaning every UK made device is now insecure. Yeah. Uh, I, I found a list by the way, there's, there's apparently 48 agencies uh, that have access, will have access to the databases uh, of um, browsing history when it's done. And the one that stood out for me, just I was scrolling through them, like, anything here surprising. And I got to the very bottom, it was the very last one. It, the Welsh Ambulance, Sur- Ambulance Services National Health Service Trust. Like, why does the ambulance service need your browsing history? He's got a broken arm. Let's see what porn he was looking at. That, that's it's not going to help treat the broken arm. It might help explain the broken arm. But well, what this comes to uh, with the encryption stuff, do you remember we had that huge ass denial of service attack based on all these? Yeah, based off of light bulbs. Yeah, this is going to be a problem going forward, only not just light bulbs now. It's going to be things that should be secure devices like computers and cell phones and laptops. The well, problem. The way I read the decryption part of it is they can go to Amazon and say, we need you to decrypt your your end of the communication so we can see what they're buying. Or they can go to the bank. They can go to um, Barclays and go, yeah. we need you to decrypt the communication so we can see where he's transferring his money. Now, my problem with the, the banks and, and, and the Amazon, they could already serve them a warrant saying, mm-hmm. we need to see what he's bought. We need to see where he's sending his money. But they didn't seem to need this. Leaving with any encryption you develop, if you leave a universal means for decryption. Oh, yes. Horrible security risk. That's if you leave with any. This is with any encryption system. If you leave a universal means to unencrypt any sort of information in there, you've essentially left the door wide open because once yeah, because it exists, it can be found. Be found. The, yeah. And so for those paying attention. So if I if I set up an encryption system with, with say, Nash. And we, we come up with the key. Now, we may use a, a, uh, a programmatic way that generates a 256 or 1,024-bit character, bit, bit string, mm-hmm. to, to encrypt our stuff. And that's fine. If, but if we don't know that the protocol we're using has a backdoor, and some, some bad guys do, they can go, well, we don't know what key they're using. That's going to be hard to figure out because the key they're using is not going to be the same key that Mike and his brother is using. Right. Or that his brother and uh, their cousin are using. But if we just work on the back door key, we just need the one key and that gets everybody. And so that's what the issue is here. In more, uh, a, a better way to sketch this out is, uh, again, going back to the TSA. Um, a while back, they uh, devised what were called TSA approved luggage locks. These were locks you could use to lock up your luggage. It had little combinations and stuff on them, but they all had to abide by this same set of keys that the TSA had access to. That meant the TSA could unlock everyone's luggage to search it. And those Which leaked. Works great until someone gets makes their own blanks. Do you know how they leaked? This is hilarious. Someone took photos of them. Photos. Yep. Okay, so. I'm not going to hold up my keys to show this, but if you, if any good keysmith mm-hmm. can look at a key and go, I can recreate that by, by hand. They made three, and, there are three D printable versions of those TSA lock keys. Yeah, and when when did they uh, when did the TSA discover that this had been done? Well, it was one of the many times that it made the news here in Los Angeles, Greater Los Angeles area, 
that the Los Angeles baggage handlers were stealing massive amounts of stuff from luggage again. Yep. How did they get in? Past the luggage keys? Oh, they had their own keys. It's actually, I haven't been watching too much news lately. It used to be every three months, almost like clockwork, there'd be a story about another set of baggage handlers at LAX getting caught stealing stuff from luggage. Any security system that has a pre-designed flaw is not secure. That's just basically how it goes. Now, yeah. let's let's look at it with Apple. That's, unique. That's known to have a pre-designed flaw. And yeah. they are by law known to have a flaw. Yeah. All they have to do is all hackers have to do is find it. But they are by law designed. Now, with, with Apple in America, we had a big rumbly a few a uh, while back trying to compel Apple to decrypt people's iPhones. This is going to present an interesting little juggling for Apple because Apple has been trying to make phones they themselves can't decrypt. This is now in order to sell iPhones in the United Kingdom, Apple is going to have to do one of two things. Either they're going to have to retreat from that stance and make iPhones across the board that they can decrypt in order to comply with the laws of the United Kingdom, one country. Because it's, it, it's cheaper to make one product line than two, and or, they can't guarantee that someone doesn't go, well, I bought this in the US, but now I'm moving to the UK, and they can still use it there. Or the another option is Apple would have to make a UK only iPhone. Or like, they keep all the keys. Or, yeah. And whenever the government comes to them and says, we need to get into this iPhone. Well, here's the key. And they just have to hand it over. And there are other companies that simply just won't make them available in the UK, but you'll be able to get them very easily. All you have to do is, I don't know, take a ferry to Ireland. They're part of the EU, not the UK. Yeah. So you just go right over to Ireland, pick up a more secure device, probably for about the same money, or use a vulnerable one. And again, this is not going to stop a terrorist because they or or a criminal or whatnot, because they can very easily circumvent this simply by getting a different device. This is a stupid law. Practically easily, boom, worked around. I don't even you don't even have to be a genius to work around this shit. Yeah. You you just have to now, there's 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 probably some clause in there that people aren't supposed to do this and we're like unless you go door to door they're gonna yeah of course they the UK does go door to door on a couple other things they periodically check to see if you have a TV because there's a TV tax it regardless the entire thing is ugh, this is yeah. th this thanks for wasting everyone's fucking time everyone. Speaking of wasting everyone's time, let's come back to the United States. Um, so this just came out. Office Depot. If you did not know, Office Depot does offer PC repair services. Yes, and they will gladly fix your PC of problems that they've created completely out of thin air. Yeah, they'll fix it whether it's got a problem or not. Um, undercover investigations have revealed Office Depot was fixing computers that were brand new out of the box and claiming they had spyware and malware and other issues. Yep. Now, it's, it's because of two real things in this. One, they had daily repair quotas. They had basically sell a certain number of repair services per day. Yep. This is the problem in retail in general, where they've got quotas on things people don't necessarily want or need. It's why when you're in this grocery, not the grocery store, and you're in a department store, they'll ask you, do you have the department store credit card? Because they've got a certain number that they're supposed to try to get signed yeah. up every day. Or do you want to put this on, you know, whatever program they have? Or, you know, that's why they ask, because they've got regional and national management hammering on them to sell these products that you don't really need. Yeah, it was pretty much a matter of you must do this many PC repairs per week or per day. And if you don't, you lose your job. So yeah. this pretty much 
pushed the employees to do this. And we're not talking at cheap repairs either. Um, charges of up to $180 or more. Yeah. Now, the second part of the problem with, with this was the software they were using. Mm. It's a software that's called PC Help Check. Which is bullshit, but... It, it, yeah, it is kind of bullshit because what it has on it, it has a few check boxes on it. Uh, when you fire it up and say, hey, I want to check this PC. And if any of these check boxes are sent, it finds an issue. Yeah, the questions included stuff about strange pop-ups, slow operating speed, virus warnings, and random shutdowns. I can show you a perfectly healthy computer that will have all of these. Simply due to uh, software conflicts, um, any website that tries to scam you into spending money on a... So pretty much the scam that Office Depot was using was building off the scams that already existed online. Yeah. So if you answered yes to any... So you go, well, yeah, my computer's occasionally slow because it's running an antivirus scan while you're trying to play Warcraft. Or... It's a cheap ass piece of shit computer. You know, so if you answer yes to any of those, they check those boxes and it, uh -huh. it comes back and goes, yes, there is potentially malware on your machine. Perfectly clean, which they, of course, verified by taking in a brand new, fresh out of the box machine and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a little slow. They, they never turned it on. Well, they turned it on to have a login, things like that. So it wouldn't look like it was completely brand new because. You know, it is slightly better than a temperature test to work in Office Depot's tech support. I worked in Office Depot's tech support. So, you know, it's slightly better than a temperature test. Oh, yeah. It was very frustrating working there. I was so happy when I quit. It was it was awful. Um, yeah. About taking your computer to a big box store like Office Depot or Best Buy or any 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 large chain store. Understand when you do so, the honest is not on them to fix your computer. It's on them to get money out of you. Yes. If they happen to fix it along the way, that's a bonus for you, but that's not why they're there. Now, you said Office Depot and, and then Best Buy. Fry's is possibly an exception, but it's, it's going to be store to store. And I say this as a person on the West Coast who deals with Fry's. I've had great luck with my local store with their tech support stuff that I've had to take one item in and get it troubleshoot, get troubleshooting on it. And but this say another store uh, much further south of me, say just north of the Mexican border um, in, in a town that uh, has a sand in front of it. Um, they're a temperature test store that when I was there. Pretty much if you need to have your computer repaired. Your best bet is to go to a smaller computer store in the area. They ask, are... Mm -hmm. And ask around. You've got a friend or a co-worker who has used one of these small computer stores. Uh, ask around. Or Try use Yelp. That has a good reputation. Yeah, or use Yelp. Google reviews, something like that. Mainly because with the local stores, they are less likely to have a chain franchise management that's pushing this set quota of this must. They're local. They, they have their own local rules based on the owner yes. who lives and in that town. Want, and they want to have a good reputation. Now, my only other piece of advice when going to a computer repair store, mom and pop type store. If their name starts with double, triple, or quadruple A, think twice unless their Yelp reviews are very yeah. And the reason I say that is because every place that starts with a double, triple, or quadruple A as their name has done so so that they're first in the phone book because many people go, I need computer repairs, triple O, triple A computer repair, first one I saw. Sorry, I'm being attacked over here. So I noticed. I see little paws would, reaching would, up. Would, would you knock it off? Would you, stop, stop it. You're you're the one hovering your arm over there now. Stop it. It's your you're encouraging him. Stop it. No. Stop. Knock knock it off. Little goober. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. 
Uh, you need to behave yourself. Else. Behave yourself. Behave yourself. You need to knock this nonsense off. <laughs> do not be, like, nope. do not be biting my hand. That's not cool. Grady, look at me. Grady. Grady, look at me. Hey. Hey, Goofus, look at me. Behave yourself. You're being bad. I'm trying to do a show. Behave. Go play. <sighs> um, um, let's hear, what, are, what, are your, what are your other suggestions for what they should look for in a good computer store? Mainly just word of mouth reviews. Other, it's, it's hard because this is one of those... Th those same practices that most large, every large store has all of these practices that seem designed to just drive customers away. Honestly, if you've gone to a store and they want to, they, they, they try to sign you up for the, the, uh, the store credit card or the bonus card, or, and they, they have this spiel at the end or service protection plans and all this shit, it's a good bet that same store's tech repair policy is structured around the same philosophy and it's a bad place to take your computer to get it fixed. Um, we we got to get questions. We have one more quick story tonight and I bring this up because uh, it is Cyber Monday coming up. Yeah, it is. Black Friday has just passed and people are out buying computers and other stuff for, for loved ones or even for themselves. Um... And you, we've started to see popping up among laptops, Intel KB Lake based CPUs, which is their latest uh, name. Yeah, the, the, this is how Intel. Um, for the, how, how do they pick names? I, I really don't know. Intel uses uh, code names for each iteration of their processor. The one before this was called Skylake. Before that was called Broadwell. Before that was called Haswell. Before that was called Ivy Bridge. Um, that's those names indicate a different generation cycle for the CPU. The latest was KB Lake, and you might think, "Oh, good! I should buy the latest. It's the best." Mm. KB Lake is slowly getting a little bit of infamy wrapped around it. Not because it doesn't work properly, not because it's a bad design, but because I think the first time I've, this is the first time I've seen this in a very, very long time, um, if ever. KB Lake is getting this notoriety because companies like Microsoft, and uh, entertainment companies are managing to push things onto the design at Intel, things that have nothing to do with the operation as a CPU and everything to do with rights management. Um, yeah. It recently came out that Netflix is offering 4K streaming finally for PC clients so for for the netflix client on pc but you ca cannot use it with any cpu except kb lake it's yeah. designed this way because they're using a uh, newer encoding um that is copy protected and what basically what they want is they want this drm built in there so that you can't watch your netflix and stream and copy it onto your computer and never have to watch Netflix again. Now, in this case, part of it is based around 10-bit um, hardware decoding support uh, for HEVC. You, know, you don't even have to worry about that. Now, the older processors, to be fair, only support up to 8-bit decoding. However, NVIDIA's newest graphics cards, which are much easier and in a lot of ways cheaper to replace than a CPU also do 10 bit decoding, but Netflix won't work with those. Well, they're not listed as compatible. They, so they, it might work with them. They're just not listing it yet. Yes, but. And, and, and there's no indication that they will list it. So that's, that's why they're saying, oh yeah, KB Lake. 
Now, the other thing about KB Lake, which I find interesting, is it's sort of a midstream upgrade. Hmm. It's not the 10 nanometer uh, chip no. upgrade that they promised. That's not happening until next middle of next year. And yeah, as 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 being, a, it's not even a really an incremental update. It, it it offers a little bit better graphics performance I've seen and a little bit better battery clock life. Speed. But the clock speed is incidental in terms of performance over Skylake, the previous generation. Not a whole lot of uh, of advancement. Also, the other reason uh, I bring it up, more PCI Express and PCI Express three lanes. Increment tiny, nothing you would notice, nothing you, nothing revolutionary in this. Just tiny, tiny things. The other reason I bring up KB Lake is um, it is the first processor that Intel has created that doesn't natively support older editions of Windows. The only one it's designed to work with is Windows 10. Can it run Windows 7 and Windows 8? Maybe we're not entirely sure, but Microsoft is not supporting the Windows 7 and Windows 8 on KB Lake. It can only it only has official support for Windows 10. Now, if someone you're buying the laptop for, or if you yourself are buying the laptop with the intention of running an older version of Windows on it, perhaps even say Windows XP, if you wanted to, just, you know, to dual boot, to run older games. It's not officially supported. It, it, KB Lake does not officially support older editions of Windows. So in general, if you're out shopping for a new laptop this Cyber Monday, based on the lack- Keep it in mind. Yeah, well, based on the lack of performance upgrade from the, uh, between differences between the two, the fact that the older Intel processors, the Skylake processors, which are still available, and you probably get a better discount on those. Um, the fact that they and KB Lake and Skylake have nil, really not hardly any noticeable performance difference between one and the other. It actually makes sense to get a Skylake one. You'll likely get a better deal on it because it's a, it's a, older model like by a few months and you will have more options on it however if you want to run netflix on your laptop in 4k this is something you have to keep in mind going forward i yeah personally i'm not i'm not of the group that needs netflix in 4k i, on look, a at light, go, yeah. I, I look at it and go if I'm watching Netflix on a laptop, I might be in somewhere that's bandwidth lim la limited anyway. Now, bandwidth limited anyway. True, but when we move forward and the KB Lake processors start um, being made for desktop systems, people who use these for HTC, HTPCs for their their home entertainment systems, yeah. I, I'm going to wait till Canon Lake at least upgrade. Now, and this is, I think this is kind of where uh, Netflix is shooting themselves in the foot. Um, you can already watch 4K Netflix conflict content on Roku, Fire TV, NVIDIA Shield, much cheaper devices. So this is kind of bad for HTPC users. And, but better for everybody else who just wants a cheap little disposable piece of shit TV box. They'll rather buy that over a much better. It's it's uh, uh. so anyway. Things to keep in questions. mind. Yeah, yeah. It's time for questions. Yeah. All right. Um, if you have questions for Mike and myself, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to answer some of your tech issues. Let's start with a really simple one. Um, from Home Jakila. Okay, Home Jakilla. Don't disrespect the Home Jakilla clan. <laughs> it sounds like something Godzilla would fight. It does. Or it's a or it's a a secondary member of the Wu Tang clan. Yeah. Um 
Very simple question here is, do you think the GeForce 1080 Ti is worth the wait? Titan is way too expensive for me, while 1080 is tolerable. Okay, well, I'm actually going, if 1080 is tolerable for you, I think your standards are a little high. Perhaps. I think he's talking about price-wise. Oh, price-wise. Okay, fair. That's that's different. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know that the TI specs are going to be different enough from the standard 1080. You got to take it back a little bit, Mike. You got to ask yourself, how many people watching know what the difference between a regular and a TI edition is? Okay. Got to take it back here, man. Uh, what we're talking about here is um, NVIDIA, when they release their video, car or their video cards, they tend to, at least in recent years, do it in these weird kind of tranches. Uh, first, they'll release the initial version. So you'll see the GeForce 1050, 1060, 1070, 1080, the standard ones. Then a few months later, six months or so later, they'll release what's called the TI editions. You'll see a little uh, capital T, little I, which is not an acronym. That would you, That's a word technically, but we, it's pronounced TI. What these are, are a slight upgrade over the initial version that was released. They, they're a little bit faster, a little bit more powerful, not tremendously. A little bit more memory? Yeah. And, and over time, these become considered the standard edition until the entire next generation is released. There's sort of a stopgap between when the, the generation initially comes out and what replaces it. Yeah. Now, with uh, with the 1080 systems, however, with, with the GeForce 10 series, at this point, in order to fully utilize a GeForce 1080, you need to either be attempting to game in 4K on your computer, or you need to be running some very heavy graphics rendering stuff, 3D rendering, video rendering stuff to, to really tap Across it. multiple monitors too. Right. At the same time. You really, you really, really need to be pushing this device. Yeah. There, there's, no, there's no app, no, excuse me, I can say there's no single app out there right now that particularly strains a 1080 card. In this case, I would say, unless you have a 4K monitor, unless you are playing some super demanding computer stuff, I wouldn't get a 1080 Ti, but I would wait for the 1080 Ti to be released. And here's why. It'll drop the price of the 1080. Right. Every time G N NVIDIA does this, when the Ti comes out, the regular version goes down in price, anywhere from $50 to $100. Wow, that's what I was about to say, yeah. And now, that may not be a lot of money for you, but, you know, it's something you can go, I'm going to go, well, I'm going to buy an extra bell, I'm going to buy an extra uh, uh, SSD, I'm going to buy, you know, another hard drive, something. Uh, yeah. The I'm looking at the spec differences between the two, and it's not, yes, you get a bunch more transistors on the chip. And the Base clock is a little little lower on the TI than on the 1080. And the boost clock is a little bit lower. The cores are higher, memory is higher, but um generally speaking, it's I I wait, I agree with Nash. I wait until it's out and then buy the uh the regular 1080. Unless NVIDIA does something really and I will say the pricing on the 10 series has been kind of mm, mainly because NVIDIA hasn't had a whole lot of competition from AMD or serious competition. The pricing on the 10 series has been a little higher. I could conceivably see, I'm not saying they're gonna do this, but I conceivably see NVIDIA re releasing the 1080 at a higher price and not dropping the prices on the earlier incarnations. At least not right away. They not will right drop away. it eventually. Eventually, but maybe even when the next generation is ready. Well, right. I, I I will say I don't think they're going to drop the prices before Christmas yeah. because right now 
I mean, when the 1080 came out, you, you couldn't get a hold of one. Yeah. Everyone was trying to buy them. Mm. And they're still in fairly high demand. In general, I'd say if you if if you're you, you unless you're trying to push your computer to some ridiculous levels that we're not quite ready for gaming wise yet, like 4K monitors and super duper uber VR shit and whatnot. Unless you're going for the top of the uh, the stupid fast top of the line with all the bells and whistles, ridiculously expensive. You don't need to wait for the TI. The 1080 will do just fine. Hell, the 1080 can even already handle a bunch of 4K stuff. So you're fine. You're fine. Yeah. Um, the next one comes from Jake. He says, I've been using Driver Booster 3 to keep my drivers updated, but I've heard they uh, had uh, serious problems with it, even though I haven't. Others have had serious problems with it, even though I haven't. I like to keep using this or another tool to update my drivers because there's no way I'll remember to do it manually. What are your thoughts? Should I just not bother? Or is DB3 fine? Or should I use something different? I hate these driver programs. I update mine manually, so I really don't, you know. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. Some of you may not. There, there are quite a number of programs offered out there, software offered out there that promises to automatically update all your drivers for you. This has been kind of, th this has always been on the sketchier end of things online. Um, I personally don't trust these programs because often they come bundled with adware that tried to trick you to installing like toolbars on your browser and change your homepage and all this stuff. Or they are actually, or they come bundled with McAfee, which is just as bad. <laughs> yeah. Or they are actual scams that come with malware built in. Yes. The reason these things are so popular is lots of people with computers hear about drivers, and they don't understand what drivers are, and they well, this program take care of it for me. Okay, this fix driver, whatever driver is, you fix, you you make go, whatever, well, go do. Go do. The deal, though, is, yeah, the deal is quite a lot of time, with the exception of your video drivers, most of your drivers don't need regular updates. And I, it's not a security issue. It's the fact that you've got your USB drivers. They don't necessarily need updates that often because they just don't. USB works, and it works fine. If you plug something in that goes, oh, I can't work with, I can't work with your computer without a USB, new, you, the updated USB driver, it tells you and you can go do it then. Yeah. The, the only... Um, go ahead. The, I say the video, video drivers are the ones that's sort of an exception to that because they come up with new efficiencies on a regular basis mm -hmm. or bug fixes or uh, specific things for specific games. And since NVIDIA is still the big dog in the house, their you know, NVIDIA experience goes out there and grabs that stuff for you and says, hey, there's a new game ready driver out here for a game you never are going to play, but we want to download it, please. Yeah, with uh, with like Mike says, with the exception of video drivers, everything else within the first two or three months of release of a new piece of hardware, there may be driver updates. But if you're not changing out your hardware very much, and if you're not reformatting your computer with Windows very often. You don't even really need to worry about your drivers. Pretty much, it's, it's pretty. It's a one and done for most of your hardware. Yeah, and and since many of your drivers come from Microsoft, or that at least the base drivers you're using come from Microsoft, if there's a massive security issue with it, there's going to be a Microsoft patch, and there have been. I view these these driver software these th that these driver update softwares. I view them very skeptically. I consider them to be more trouble than they're worth. And you should never add things to your computer to do th unless you need them because they're taking up space. They're putting keys in the registry. They're they're causing potential um, conflicts along the way. If you don't need something on your computer, you shouldn't have it installed on your computer. They in, ge in general, that's the that that is a very fast way to get your computer slower 
and less productive. Because it's trying to load stuff in startup, it's trying to keep track of file associations, it's it's doing more work just because you have more software installed. Yes. And now, of course, the, the difficulty, yeah, and, and there is a potential here, yeah, you do something and you go, oh, this, this thing's not working now. And is it a driver issue? Well, the quick, the easy way to check, if, really, if it's a driver issue, is to go to your computer's device manager. Mm. And look for something with a little red triangle, excuse me, a little yellow triangle or a little red mark next to it that says, hey, there's a conflict or this didn't load properly. You look for that thing and you find the updated driver for that thing and see if the problem then goes away. And if it doesn't, hey, write us and we'll maybe it'll, we might be able to sort it out for you. Maybe, yes. Um, next one comes from Abstruse, is the username. He says, there's a distinct hum or buzz when I try to record sound, no matter if it's through Audacity, OBS, or directly into my room, uh, into my Zoom R16. Uh, while maybe something doing my setup, there's a chance it's from my fan or air conditioning. Is there a solution, either hardware or software, to eliminate background noise? Well, I would say that the, the question is, you really need to first identify where the buzz is coming from. Um, it could be coming from your your whatever your you know your your wall socket effectively it could be an electrical hum uh, and there are uh, plugs you can get out there to say reduce hum yeah uh, actually I have one right here this this kind of question actually covers not just recording but a lot of different audio applications this could apply to your television audio setup this could apply to um, uh, electric guitar audio setup um, there are different things that could potentially be at work here. Um, like M Mike is, is going off the first one. What Mike is talking about is a ground loop hum. Yes, it, and you'll be able to tell if it's a ground loop hum very easily if it's a 60 cycle per second hum. Yeah, it's yeah, it's called ground loop. It's called a 60 cycle hum. It's a very distinctive noise. Now, what it's caused by is, and even with my electrical knowledge, it's hard to just quickly put into words, but it's caused by two different audio devices um, on the same circuit. The way their grounds are connected to a, the electrical outlet. If there's some sort of way in which they feed into each other ground wise, this causes a cyclical hum. Now, with most electrical appliances, you don't notice it because they don't make sound. But with audio, it actually becomes part of the signal. Uh, Mike's got a little device there. What's it called? This is the HumX uh, Hum Voltage Hum Eliminator by EB Tech. Yeah, it's it, about a fifty dollar device. Yeah, it's a standard one that's used across a lot of the industry. Cause it's a quick little device you plug into your wall socket, and then you plug your audio into that. And it yeah. breaks the ground hum, stops that 60 cycle hum. And if you're not sure if that's what's causing it, uh, go to YouTube and Google the word 60 cycle hum. And you can hear exactly what that sounds like. And if that's what, what, what you're hearing, there's your problem right there. Now, the difficulty with these guys is you basically need one of these per sound device. Hmm. Uh, you can't plug it in between the power strip and that you've got everything plugged into right. and expect it will work properly. Yeah. So, you, you know, you can't go wall socket, this power strip. You've got to go power strip. This plugs into the power strip for each sound device. So $50 a device is not cheap. Hmm. So that's why you go to YouTube, as Nash said, and listen to 60 hertz hum. And if that's it, great. See what you can do then. Now, there... if it's not, <clears throat> if it is, if you have determined it's like your, your window fan or your AC, uh, You've suggested before the, the boxing around the microphone. Yeah, right? that, that is one. Uh, uh, you can build a little, use a egg crate carton foam and just a large enough cardboard box and put your microphone in there and then run the ca cables out the back. That will eliminate a lot of extraneous noises. If it's more serious than that, I mean, and th this is, you can look into, now I wouldn't recommend going the hardware route because that involves a lot more studio type stuff. W what you're looking at there is um, noise reduction. And 
And um, there are a couple ways to do it. I do it hardware via what's called a compressor, which I'm not going to recommend because it's a lot more complicated. You are using Audacity, however. That's the one I wanted to. That's the that's the one I was trying to remember. Audacity. Yeah. Uh, has I don't remember the settings on it, but there's plenty of online tutorials on how to use it to produce hum. Yeah, there, there is a noise uh, canceling options inside Audacity. There are plugins that will. What it does is you can let it listen to a sample of audio. And th this is a good way to do it. Um, make sure when you start recording, leave some dead air in there. Don't talk. Just let the mic record for like maybe 30 seconds before you actually start talking. What you're doing there is you're leaving a sound sample in the audio that it can identify the noise. You can copy that noise, go throughout the entire audio track. It will find wherever that steady, constant noise is being made and eliminate it from, from the recording. It can yeah, just and the way it does... The way it does that, if, if you've ever seen wave cancellation stuff, so you got a sine wave doing this, effectively, and it just reverses the wave and sums them together and you get a flat line. So it can take that noise out of your recording. It also, there, there are other plugins built into Audacity, it, which is, I will point out, is one of the best free audio, is, well, it is yeah. the best free audio recording suite available. And if you, all you have to do to, to figure out how to use it Go to Google and type in Audacity Noise Removal. Your first, your top five hits will tell you, there's even a wiki. Yeah. So Wiki.audacityteam.org for noise reduction. And that's probably the one you want to go to because that's the people who wrote the software. The only downside is you're going to have to learn shit. Sorry. Welcome <laughs> to doing this on a regular basis. You've got to teach yourself stuff to make it work. It's not just a one and done. You got to learn. There's no one size fix all fixes one size fits all for some of these problems. You've got to learn how to fix them. Um, I think our last one is going to be Antonio's because this is a long question. Okay. Um, yeah, this and it's an odd one. Well, no, no, not not well. No, actually, we can do two. Um, I'm talking about Dragon Eleven Thirty. Antonio's is, is is a brief one. Oh. we can do that. We can do Antonio's. Oh yes. Uh, Antonio asks us, uh, Wi-Fi connected video doorbells, more of a security risk or more of a security benefit? It depends on if the people who do them update their software and have things in there that prevent yeah. the DDoS attacks. Or you can, or you know enough to set up your router to prevent it from talking to anything except, say, your phone. Yeah, we're talking about uh, these uh, doorbells you can get now that you can put on your on your front door that have a little webcam built into it and it uses your wi-fi network to stream back a video signal of who is standing at your door it's a nice idea and they also make versions of them that are, are motion sensitive yeah. so you can see when the delivery guy drops off a package now or think, drops off a package as the case may be i think they are a security benefit in certain respects but they can be a security risk in others the security benefit this just happened to a friend of mine last month. He got the video of UPS dropping off the package. And then he got a second video alert about half an hour later of some guy who randomly drove by, saw a package, and ran up and picked it up. He had video of the guy. It went on his local news. They caught the guy. That is where it could be a benefit. But as with most of these Internet of Things devices right now, It's becoming a hindrance because while it promises security for you on one side, the device itself is not very well made or secure, yeah. which means it could be hacked. So if, if it is configurable or your router, you know enough about your router to configure your router so that the device is only allowed to talk to a few other things. For instance, it can call home so it can get security updates mm. from its manufacturer. That's allowable or maybe you just do this firmware-wise yourself. Uh, and to you, if you can filter it out to that, that's probably okay. If you can't, then it's possible it could be used for a DDoS. Yeah, at this point in time, I have a hard time recommending any Internet of Things devices at all. They have been for, since their inception, 
more of a security risk and a danger to you and your home network and a danger to the internet in general, thanks to their uses, use in bot swarms. Um, I have a hard time recommending purchasing any Internet of Things device. You would be much better served by getting a hardwired device or even by putting a webcam up with a heart with a cable a wire connected to it um that and then you can there is software you can set your webcam up to record motion sensitive stuff and and you know activate when motion passes by it's workable that way it's just it's i these companies are churning them out at such a grossly fast rate and they're not doing proper security on them they become more dangerous than any problem they promise and purport to solve so i would my own unless you really know what you're doing like mike said unless you really know what you're doing with your home network i wouldn't trust any internet of things device as it stands right now we're years away from them coming up with acceptable security standards there's no regulation whatsoever anywhere so yeah um, would a streaming stick be considered an Internet of uh, Things device? Yeah, it would. If you can't hardwire it, if you can't use an Ethernet cable on it, I would be leery of it. Now, I will say people like Roku and Google and uh, Apple do take the time to secure their devices a little better. In that case, it's a matter of look at the company, look at their history, look at their reputation, but even then, it's still a crapshoot these days. However, a, a nice bit about this is most of these streaming devices do still have a hardwired Ethernet port. Even Google Chromecast, uh, you can buy a power, the power adapter that comes with it is also the Ethernet adapter. Yep, that's how I use it. Whenever possible, always use a hard line connection and don't let those devices be on your Wi-Fi. It's more secure that way. Not completely but it's better than just being an open wi-fi signal and we went over time we're over time so okay all right that's that's going to be us for tonight then because we had uh, thank you for your well, all right i'm gonna try and answer all right we'll go one more we'll go one more even though we're running over time i want to answer dragon's question now this is it's this, a tricky one yeah this one's a long long question um, what happened here was he bought a new modular power supply for his computer. And after he installed it, a bunch of weird things started happening. Um, windows did not, we get the windows did not shut down properly error. Um, his computer would randomly shut off. It seems, uh, unless he was playing a game, in which case it would stay up all the time. So in this case, and he's saying, what's causing this? What's the problem? Is it the power supply or did something else randomly go bad? I would likely tell you that if you make a change to your system, the last thing you change, and suddenly things start going wrong, the last thing you changed is your primary suspect. Now, the good news is you say you got it a few months ago, which means you're likely still under warranty. It's going to be a pain in the butt for you to do, I realize, but EVGA, the people you got it from, they will allow you to RMA the device. Heck, that uh, uh, CPU cooler I had that died, um, Corsair had a very simple RMA process. I'm about to send it back now and get a replacement. I don't want them to use it in, but they're going to replace it for me. Um, You'll have a backup when the current one dies. Yeah. The RMA process, now, the way this is going to be a pain in the butt is you're going to have to mail it back to them and they're going to have to receive it before they'll send you a new one. So you might have to switch back to another power supply for a while. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I, I find it strange that when the system has a load running more intensive stuff, the graphic card being utilized heavier, that it doesn't shut off. That tells me that there's some sort that it feels like there's some sort of strange sh short in the system that is not being triggered when there's a load. Or potentially um, there might even be something with the uh, the power efficiency 
there, there's just a bad component in there. Maybe a bad yeah. capacitor, maybe a bad, just something like that that's not working right when it's in lower power mode. But when it's in full power mode, yeah, it could it could be a, a, a sort of a thermal expansion thing. Yeah, when when it's when it's running warmer, something whatever is whatever is malfunctioning has expanded enough that it's got a solid contact. Mm -hmm. But when it's running cooler, it's contracted and cold it doesn't. solder joints. Yeah, that's one one thing to check before you do the RMA is unplug and replug the components mm -hmm. just to make sure you've got a good solid connection in yeah. there. Uh, everything that yeah pretty much make sure everything is plugged in secure make sure all the wires are right make sure go through just one more double check um but otherwise yeah it's with with computers uh it's it's always the first primary suspect is the last thing touched in the system that's causing an issue um that's just general rule it's not always but it usually is it's like you know, general rule of thumb the last thing you change in your machine is the first suspect when problems start cropping up. So in this case, yeah, um, I'm willing to bet there's just something hinky about it. Uh, like Mike said, just that when it cools that cold solder joints, these this, these are nasty. OK, when you place components on a circuit board and you solder them into place, if you don't do it exactly right, uh, when the solder is very cold it shrinks up to a point or there's a crack in it that causes the connection to break but when it heats up again during normal use that solder melts remember the red ring of death on the xboxes yep that was what was called there were cold solder joints inside the xbox and people noticed i don't know how they noticed this when they wrapped the, the xbox in a towel and let it heat up, the Xbox would start behaving again. That's because they were heating up the circuit board and the solder was flowing where it was supposed to. And when they took the towel off and it cooled down, it stopped working again. And you know, that was that was tricky for me too, because the Xbox ran hot enough on, on its own. Yeah. And wrapping in a towel would be ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah. This is this so it's 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 check the power it, it, sh sh long story short um check the connections um if you still have the old power supply swap it back in and see if it, if the behavior goes away after you check the connections and if it does your best bet is contact the EVGA and get an RMA you you got a dud it happens yeah all right, so that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. If you have questions for us, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. For Mike and myself, we'll see you next time.